Thank you. There we go. So, um, I think my microphone is on. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, so, I'm going to tell you today about the tools that we are developing, a few of them, to do brain research. Janelia Farm's purpose is fundamental research. It's not closely related to medicine. The most advanced creature that we do research on is a rat. Um, and so, but on the other hand, the world's understanding of how brains works is nearly absent. We couldn't hope to understand the complexity of a rat brain. We try really hard to understand fruit fly brains. They are just beyond us. And so, um, the, the, the first thing I'd like you to understand is there's plenty of room for contributions. And so if, even at your very tender age, when, when I had a niece about your age ask me what grade I was in, and I said 21st, um, she didn't believe there was such a grade. <laughs> there is, and so you might not be halfway there yet, but not, nonetheless. Um, so, so the point of this uh, is, is twofold. Just to give you an example of the fact that there are biological problems which are entirely limited by our ability to make measurements. Fruit flies are just great at doing what they do, and we don't understand it. And the problem is, how do you understand what they do? So I was going to tell you who I am, and, and uh, your dean did most of this, and so the, the only thing I'm going to talk about is sort of the variety of things that, that I've been involved in you know, through the years. The only point of which is, is that you don't have to end up where you started out. So I have an undergraduate degree in chemistry and a graduate degree in analytical chemistry. I went to Bell Labs. At Bell Labs, what's important is physics. So four years after I was there, everyone thought I was a physicist because I studied solid state devices and materials. And we did quantum dot physics. And friends of mine have become very famous for that. And th this drove us into microscopy technology because we couldn't understand the quantum dots. And so we invented a new kind of microscopy to try and help for that. And it turned out that microscope was really good for seeing a single molecule. So we invented single molecule detection, which is now 20 years old. In fact, it's just 20 years old this year. Um, and so then I left um, Bell Labs and went off to biology because I thought, well, measurement problems are more important than biology. All this stuff has been made. And so I went to this tiny little company with less than 10 employees in Princeton. And we did single molecule DNA sequencing, which we failed at. And so we invented a, a microscope and a drug discovery business so we wouldn't be unemployed. And then we got bought by Amersham, and so we transferred that technology to them. And then I went off to a brand new startup. I was the research director of the startup in Cambridge, Massachusetts, across the street from MIT. And we, in fact, did single molecule detect sequencing again, and this time it worked. And so that became a commercial technology. And then when that was finished, I was recruited to come at Genelia Farm. Um, uh, I knew nothing about neuroscience. I mean, I knew what you know about neuroscience, what you read in the newspaper. And so the most important lesson of, of the entire talk is that you can learn anything you need to know um, and contribute to the state of the art of science. So I'm going to start out with one admonition about our environment. This is that we live next to the Potomac River, and it's just an absolutely wonderful place. So this is me and my boat on ice skull on the Potomac nearly every morning. It was just perfect out there today. But mostly I gave you this picture not only because it's a cool picture, and all I can take credit for is making these ripples in the water. Everything else was due to the photographer. Um, I did it because I wanted to talk about contrast. So the person who took this picture is the editor of the, of the magazine Physics Today, Stephen Benka, who just works across the river in Chevy Chase. Um, and the thing is, is that you can't see his name there, and you can't see his name there. And in, in imaging science, we call that contrast. You can't see anything that's not different from its background. White on white's not visible. So there's a word for that. We call it contrast. And so this is a first vocabulary word. And ever since I was as young or younger than you, that my experience is the only serious barrier to learning anything new is vocabulary. In fact, the concepts are easier than this. So if you could just learn the words, then you're home free. And so what I've done here is I wrote contrast twice. It's written here in white, and you can't see it because it's white on white, and it's written here in black, and you can see it. And so if I give it a black background, now you can see contrast written in white. And you can't see contrast written in black, even though it's written there. The point is, is that if you don't make what you want to see different from what it's, what's around it, you can't see it. And that is one of the principal tool-making activities, is how do you make visible that which you're trying to observe? 
So we can put in a background, and you can see both of them, and we can put a difference. So there's a bunch of ways to make contrast. And making contrast is one of the specific objectives of tool makers in science. So what's the problem? So this is a little video that was made by HHMI, and they have a, a series of lectures every fall right around Thanksgiving they call a holiday lectures. They are spectacularly well done. They're made for non-scientists, and they spend a lot of money making them really cool. And so I took this video from it. So this is a guy named Tom Jessel from, from Columbia University, and I'm going to play this thing and talk about what we are trying to see. So here's a cartoon of three neurons. So we're going to start up there, and now that, that, so neuronal signals are electrical, just like signals in wires, and your neurons are the wires. And you can see, however, neurons are really complicated wires. They have all kinds of branches, and they connect all to each other. And you can see that they connect each other across these gaps that are called synapses. And the signal jumping from one gap to the next is a really complicated chemical process. And so I'm going to stop the video when a specific event happens here. So here comes the signal, and what happens is right there. So what's going to happen is these molecules are going to get spit out and go over and collide, and collide with these molecules to make the signal jump the gap. And this all happens in less than a millisecond. But the process of that is these little channels opened up as a result of the electrical charge coming down the neuron, and a whole bunch of calcium ions flowed in. It's just the same kind of calcium ions that is in your food. This is one of the reasons you need calcium. And so that's something associated with a neuron firing, and we're going to use that. So I'm going to turn the movie back on. So the calcium goes in, the molecules get spit out, Part of them collide with the next neuron. There's only 50 nanometers, you know, between there and there. These are almost touching. And then a bunch of ions go in, and on down the, the neuron goes the signal. So this is a completely artificial view. So, the pro so if this was the problem, then we'd be OK. This isn't the problem. These three neurons are embedded in an entire spaghetti of other neurons. These three neurons would encompass perhaps a thousand other neurons crowded around them. There's no empty space in, in your brain, none at all. And so, and you can see that they've got this completely artificial notion of neuron number one connects in one place with neuron number two, and then neuron number two connects in a few places with neuron number three. And the problem is, is that every neuron has about a thousand in connections and a thousand out connections in this opaque gray goo. And so, that's why it's hard, is that you're trying to measure electrical activity at the bottom of a bowl of spaghetti, in which each strand of spaghetti has a thousand connections in and out. So that's why we don't understand brains, because it's just too hard. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we need tools to do it. So the great news is here is, is that I'm going to be dead long before we have this problem solved. And so you guys have plenty of opportunity here. So when I use the word tool, I mean you know, that which we use to do stuff, and it's very generic. So Phil Long, who was on our facilities department, you know, uses hammers and saws and things. Naji, who's one of our research fellows, invents new kinds of microscopy that allow you to see deeper into this brown goo. So the problem with, with goo is that it's blurry. And so she's invented a new kind of microscopy that has something called adaptive optics. So the reason all of these really cool telescopes have been built around the world in the last 30 years is that people figured out how to take the blur out of the signal going through our atmosphere. It used to be that those images were really crummy. So that's an adaptive optics problem, and the microscopists are onto that now, and so instead of looking through really blurry stuff, you can de-blur the signal um, and take much better pictures, and we can see about twice as deep as we used to be able to see. Now that doesn't sound like much, but you know, twice as deep is way better than we were doing you know, for the last 15 or 20 years. Computers are obviously really important tools because we make tons and tons of data. So this is the, the, the manager of our computer cluster at Genelia Farm. We have a room with 4,000 processors in a big cluster, and mostly it generates an immense amount of heat uh, and lots of computations, and I use it every day. And then, and then a really, really important tool that people often don't think about tools is software. 
And in fact, this is more important than this because, you know, this guy, Sean Eddy, worries about how to understand whether or not two proteins are similar to one another from different species. So what you do is you measure the sequence of protein A, and then you compare it to the database of all the proteins that you know, and they're not identical or anything like it, but you want to know, you know, are there other proteins that look like my protein, or is my protein a peer in a rat, because I want to understand what the protein does. So in the past four years, he started um, a program that he called Hammer, and it is 100,000 times faster than it was four years ago, just because the software is better. It's running on the same computer. Really, really important work. So the, the, the news is, is that you can, you can be a computer scientist, you can be an engineer, you can be a physicist biologist, um, and, and play an important role in neuroscience research. So what tools do we need? Well, I showed you this picture and told you that the signals are voltages. So the obvious thing you'd want to do is measure the voltage everywhere in the neuron. So we have good tools for measuring voltage in one place. It's really hard to measure voltage in more than one place. So you stick a wire in. OK, fine. Um, in fact, the ability to measure the voltage of a single neuron was an immensely important accomplishment in neuroscience history. It happened about 35 years ago. A German named Burke Sackman and his colleague Thayer, Nair, they won a Nobel Prize for this, and it's universally regarded really important development. But on the other hand, it's one part of one neuron at a time. And all of this stuff that's going on in this huge tree is invisible. And so you, you know nearly, I mean, you know, you need, a, you need a billion bits of information and you got one. So we got some work left to do. So the voltage of many neurons or parts of neurons is, is a really important question and it's nearly not possible. So the tools are just lousy. So there are too many neurons and not enough wires. Start sticking wires into brains. There's not much brain left after a while. So you could, the, I, you could, you could try and invent a way to image voltage. So people have been working on this for about 30 years, and it doesn't work worth a darn. Um, it's the right problem. We don't know how to do it. If you've got a great idea, you know, you'll be famous. You'll win a Nobel Prize. So there are many active projects around these at, 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 at Genelia Farm, but one of the things people have done for about the last 15 years is measure calcium instead. So you remember when I showed you the movie, when the neuron fired, the voltage went up and down, and as a result of that, a bunch of calcium shot in from the outside. So the question is, well, maybe we can measure calcium and ask, OK, so we saw the neuron fire. It's less than all the information you want, but you know, m maybe it's, it's a good substitute. So how do you do that? So I'm going to talk about two kinds of tools today. I'm going to talk about microscopes, which I build, and why they work and how they work. And I'm going to build a microscope over here on this whiteboard. So the second most important message that I want you to go home is that I want you to walk past a microscope from now on and understand exactly what's in that box. It is simple. People try and make it complicated. Trust me, I build microscopes for a living. There's nothing to it. The principles are as simple as anything you will want to know. So we'll build one, and, and you'll understand how, uh, wh why and how it is. And, and so the question is, why do we need microscopes? Well, the obvious thing is you need microscopes to see small stuff. Neurons are small. On the other hand, you need to be able to see so we need contrast. So how are we going to make contrast? You know, if you look at the brain, this is like this sort of gray goo. So that's not very informative. So you need reagents to make visible that which you're trying to measure. So voltage would be great. As I said, people have been trying for 30 years. They're really lousy reagents. Well, how about a, how about a reagent for calcium? Maybe we can make calcium into a reagent. And, so, and what you want is the, 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 the signal, the visibility, the, the picture to change when it goes from inactive to active, because that's what we're trying to measure, brain activity. So just as an aside, you may have seen last week there was a whole bunch of press buzz around the brain activity map and a new initiative out of the White House. So I was one of three people who went to the White House last week for this announcement. So this is not news. You know, the world's been at this for a long time. Janelia Farm has been deeply involved in this. But this is exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about how to measure activity. So, we're going to talk about microscopes and lenses. You know, the three important things in a microscope are the lenses and then light sources. And, you know, lasers help that out a lot. And detectors, well, the detector for most of microscopes history has been your eye, and it's a pretty good detector. Cameras are almost entirely dominant now. Cameras have become incredibly cheap. You know, the camera in your cell phone, which is a really great camera, costs a dollar. Um, and so, and the lens, which, which is on that camera, 
which is a spectacular piece of optic, absolutely not possible to make 15 years ago, costs a nickel. Um, and so, you know, th that kind of technology for consumers has really impacted what you can do in the lab. So, vocabulary number three, refraction. So, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna do this on the whiteboard when we get going here. So, if you send a beam of light through a material at an angle, it gets, it gets bent. It means it changes its angle here and it changes its angle out. And if it doesn't hit it at an angle, if it hits a square, it doesn't move at all. So, that's easy to see. So if I just take my brick here, so I'm going to turn the lights down a little bit. So if you can see the streaks across the whiteboard here, they're going more or less straight. And all I have to do is tilt it over and you can see that it bends it down. It doesn't change its direction, it translates it. So now it's, it's still going parallel here and everything's fine. So that's called refraction. So, what a great idea, but what's it good for? Well, if I wanted the beams down here, I could just move my light source. Well, what it's good for is making a lens. So, you know, we're up to about 350 years ago now. So, what happens if you make a not square object? So, these rays hit it here and they bend, and these rays hit it here and they bend, and if you make the right shape, you're all going to end up parallel from or focused, depends on which way the light goes. It's the same both ways. And so we're going to do both things here. So I have here a lens. And you can see that the parallel rays all focus to the same spot. And the cool thing is, is that it doesn't matter where I hit them, they, 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 they hit at the same spot. So I can go up, my magnet's a little strong and down, and you see two things here. You see the spot not change much, but you also see bad aberrations. So this is not a great lens. It's actually a semicircle, which is, and so it works okay in the middle, and by the time you get to the edges, things get kind of ugly. And you can see that if I add a couple more rays. Why isn't light coming out of there? There we go. Can't even see it. So, ah, cool effect. It totally internally reflected off the inner surface. That's what prisms do, but we won't deal with that. So, let's, let's make a microscope. So now, the, uh, the idea here is that I've got a small object and I want to see it bigger. So, my object is sort of a little bit above the line, a little bit below the line, and what happens when you put a lens where I put a lens is that it collects the rays and it sends all the rays from one point out parallel to one another, if the, if the microscope is pretty good. And so, if you put if you put the lens in the right place, that's what happens. And there we are, more or less. So, but you can see that those outside rays are really behaving kind of badly. Um, and so, again, if, if, uh, if I, if, so now if I move this, if, if I, so, so here's the other edge of my object. So you can see these rays are parallel, but the ray that got to the edge just really got distorted badly. And the same thing down here is that this guy near the edge of the lens got really ugly. So, the world knew how to build a microscope about this good about 350 years ago. And almost all of the microscopy since then is trying to fix what you just saw. So, I'm going to eliminate these outside rays because the rest of the, the, the demo requires us to Do, okay, so there's the other side, you saw that. So now I need to refocus them. So I'm going to show you something that's really important. So I'm going to turn my lens around, 
and I'm going to put my beans back parallel. Let me get the lens out of the way. It's easier to do it. Okay. So now we're going to focus those guys. So that's just terrific, you know, pretty good focus. But look what happens if I add these outside guys. They just don't go to the same place at all. That's called aberration. And trying to make a better microscope to see a smaller thing suffers from just this. And so I'll show you what you do about it, but we have to finish our microscope first. So we'll go back to, the, we'll go back to collecting light from a spot. And we'll get rid of these guys, get rid of that guy. Okay, so we'll go back to the focal length. You notice that the focal length on the front side and the back side is different. That's not true of a really high quality lens, but as I said, you know, my lens is a hunk of plexiglass. So, what are we going to do? So, you just saw that. Aberration. Um, it's because this surface is circular. If it were a parabola, that wouldn't happen. The problem is, is that you don't know how to grind a parabola. You know how to grind the spherical surface. Well, the reason that your, that your cell phone lens is so awesome and so cheap is that that is now a cast optic and it is a parabola. That's a brand new thing. When I was your age, you couldn't make a parabolic lens. Um, and so parabolic lenses made all of this much, much easier. So now we need an image. So we need another lens. <coughs> so. So this lens has a focal length that's three times longer than that lens. It's also a, a, a spherical surface, but the sphere would have been about that big. And so you can see that it focused it over here. And even though I can't, it's really hard to, to, to do the demonstration, this, this point, if I, move, if I move my light sources up there, and I wasn't so close to the edge, these guys would be three times further below that than they are above that. And the same thing on the other side. And so the reason I went through all of this in this detail was to convince you it is, that's it. That's it. There's nothing else in a microscope. It's two lenses. Now you can put, you know, cameras in and you can put prisms to direct the beam from A to B, but there's nothing else going on in a microscope. And so, so whenever you walk by one and see one on a bench, realize it's a short focal length lens and a long focal length lens. The end metal around it so you can't see the innards. But there's a lot left to do. And so it's really, you know, so you, nowadays you put a camera there because cameras are really cheap and they're better than your eye and they can see nearly no photons. And so that thing out there is called the image plane because that's where all the light focuses again. And so you put your camera there. In fact, you can't put your eye there for reasons that are a little more complicated than I want to explain. Your eye needs to be about 20 centimeters from an object in order to be able to focus on it. And so, in fact, you'd put your eye about 20 centimeters from that, and then you'd, you'd be able to see the object big. It's not that easy. So here's, here's my objective, kind of crummy. Um, a really great objective. So there are 16 individual optical pieces all stuck together in exactly the right shape and size. This is what a really first-rate objective looks like. But it does exactly the same thing. There's a point down here, and collimated light comes out up there. And so again, when you see one of these things, think it's a lens. Nothing else there. So all of this stuff is there for three reasons. So first of all, you, you can focus on a plane. And so the problem is, is that with that objective, that things on the left side and on the right side focus differently than the things in the middle, and so you see blurry stuff at the edges. So that's called a flat field, and so all this stuff is to fix that. And the second thing is, is that different colors focus in different places. And that caused problems for a long time, and um, it's still hard to fix in some cases. So a bunch of these lenses have different refractive indices, meaning the speed of light goes through them at a different rate, and that's to fix it so all the colors focus in the same place. But it's just a lens, and it doesn't do anything different than that does, except for it does it better. Nothing else there. So, so now we got a microscope, 
I can shut my lights off and turn the lights back on so my videographer is no longer taking anonymous voices. Um, and we need to see something. So, as I told you, the problem is we don't know how to make voltage contrast yet. If you've got a great idea, you know, send us, send us an application. Calcium and neuron follows voltage. It's not as fast, but remember the movie, it, it's, it's every time a neuron fires, you see calcium go in. So maybe we can see the calcium. So there are chemical sensors, chemistry. I'll, I'll show you the guy that invented them. That, that, makes, that, that makes fluorescence when calcium is present. But the problem is you got to get them inside the neuron, and that's not that great for neurons. And so these guys invented a better way to do it. So the guy that invented almost all the chemistry to this name is Roger Chen. He's a professor at UC San Diego. He's a really amazingly smart guy. And so I've known him for about 15 years now. And Marty Chalfi and he and this guy in, um, together, but separately, all at the same time, took a protein out of a jellyfish. So these jellyfish uh, are in Puget Sound. They're pretty big. I mean, they're big. They're not really tiny jellyfish. And when you disturb the water, they flash. Well, the molecule that's fluorescing is green fluorescent protein. Nobody knew this until about the 85 or 86 or something like that. But no one knew what, what, what was, was emitting light. So this is a protein, and in the, in the age of genetic engineering, you can find the gene for the protein, and you can stick the gene in anything you want, and so somebody decided to stick them in mice. So here are green fluorescent mice. All of them are, fl are fluorescing away, um, and some of their brothers are not. Um, and so that's, that's now standard. I mean, this is trivial technology by modern biology standards. But we want a calcium sensor. So there's a guy at Bell Labs named Lauren Luger, and he has a group, one of the, one of the principal people in this group was named Lynn Tian. She's now a professor at the University of Oregon um, uh, Medical Center in Portland. And they made a protein that changes when it sees calcium. And so this is what it looks like if you just have a tube of it. But this is what it looks like if you have a fluorescence microscope. So it goes from that to that. So it's kind of dim when it's inactive, and it's much brighter when it's active. And so this molecule has changed neuroscience fundamentally in the last year. There are a thousand labs in the world that adopted that molecule in the last year. So that shows you the power of tools. If you make a better tool, everybody goes in the direction because we're so bad at neuroscience, you know, any improvement helps. And so it's an immense breakthrough. And so lots of new experiments are going to be possible now because we have this protein. It's a protein. Um, and, um, and you can put it where you need it um, and make photons. And so I'm going to show you the movie again. So now think about how we might see this. So this is a cartoon of voltage. So here comes the voltage down the wire. Jumps across the gap, down the wire. Jumps across the gap, down the wire. That takes about 25 milliseconds. So here we go. High resolution. So this is the synapse. So this is where. So. So here comes the voltage. So this calcium's on the outside. It opens those little green hockey pucks, and in rushes the calcium. That's where the calcium comes from. The cell itself pumps the calcium out. And when you open up holes, the calcium rushes in. So this is the latest and greatest. So these two young guys, Misha Ahrens and Philip Keller. Philip's been at, at Genelia for about two and a half years, and Misha just six or eight months. They have done an experiment that would have been thought impossible until very recently, and it's just published, just this past month in Nature Methods. It's not even in print yet. It's just been published online. And at, at, the, at the press conference after the announcement at the White House last night, or last week, uh, Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, mentioned this paper as an example of, of what's going to happen. And so we can't get this movie to play in in the presentation, and so I took the movie out. 
So here it comes. This is an image of a live zebrafish. It's held stationary. Believe it or not, you can put a larval zebrafish in agar and it doesn't die. It apparently absorbs oxygen through its skin adequately. And this is an image of the entire zebrafish's brain, all of the neurons firing, the entire thing. So there are 100,000 neurons in this movie. Now it's not a perfect, so you can see these patterns every once in a while, and here's, this. so it's sped up, you know, that, that, that this, is, this is a movie of, you know, I don't know, six or eight hundred frames or something like that. It goes one frame, uh, the, the, the real time of the movie is one frame per second. So this is an incredible achievement. People before took, took movies of six neurons, eight neurons, it's a hundred thousand neurons. This is a whole brain. Now, we don't understand this brain, and we need to know a lot of anatomy. The problem is, is you say, okay, so that neuron fired and that neuron fired, but where are the wires? We don't know where the wires are. We don't know how to know where the wires are. It's too hard. And so there's a lot of work left to do, but immense progress is being made at a pace you would, that I would not have predicted. And so, so things are, great things are happening, but there's a lot left to do. So... <coughs> I'm going to wrap it up here because I know you guys are on a schedule. So, so what else is to do? So we have a great calcium sensor. It's fast enough. It's not voltage. We'd rather do voltage. But in fact, so much progress has been made on calcium sensors over the past five years that we're sort of done. I mean, we tackled the problem. GCAMP 6 is great. It's green. So what else would you like to do? Well, what people like to do is they like to put one color in one kind of neuron and another color in a different kind of neuron and see whether you go A to B, A to B, or B to A. That would be a great experiment. The trouble is there's no R camp 6. There's no Y camp 6. There's no B camp 6. And so Jasker Ackerboom and in a whole big project that we, that we call Genie is in the process of trying to make something as good as G camp 6 with a different color. So you can get fluorescence proteins out of corals and other things that have, different, that have different colors, but it's hard to make as good a sensor. And so there's some few years work left to do on that. I, I wouldn't suggest that as your thesis project. It'll probably be finished by the time you get there. Um, but it's really important work. So are we done yet? Not hardly. I would argue to you that we are at less than 0.1% of understanding of an insect brain. Your brain will not be understood until I'm dead and you're dead and your children are dead. It's a, it's, I think it's a thousand year problem. Um, now that may say something about your brain, but I think it's mostly just about humans in general. And so, so, so what we want and what the White House announced last week was we need ways to see neural activity. And then we need anatomy. We need to know who's connected to whom. The anatomy is the harder problem because it is really tangled. But we're making progress, and people think that maybe in a decade we'll actually have the, the interconnection wiring diagram of, uh, of a fruit fly. You know, may not seem awesome to you, but it's certainly awesome to neuroscientists. Because they have 100,000 neurons and about 10 million or maybe even 100 million connections. Really complicated system. Um, but on the other hand, a microprocessor has a billion connections, and so it's not impossible to think you could understand such a thing. The problem with, 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 with neurons is that in, in a microprocessor, one transistor usually has one input and one output. In a, in, in a brain, each neuron has a thousand inputs and a thousand outputs, and so it's much harder. So what would we like? Well, so for calcium, we're doing pretty well. So we'd like it brighter. It's get, you know, so, so I made this slide when we had GCAMP3. So GCAMP6 is brighter. We see a bigger change when the calcium comes in. We'd like more colors. That's, that, we're, not, we're not there yet. We'd like them to be less toxic. Well, you know, these aren't natural proteins. You stick them into, the, into a live thing, and it's not all that happy about it. Um, and so, so if you could make it brighter, you could put less in. That's a good thing. Um, or if you can make the chains bigger, you could put less in. That's a good thing. Or if you can just fix it so that the cell doesn't mind, that's a good thing. Um, and in biology, you usually try everything, and so we're trying everything. Could be longer lasting. The trouble is, is taking these movies kills these molecules. 
Killing molecules is bad for neurons, too, and so you'd like them not to fade. They fade. And what we'd really like is that they're not there until you turn a switch, and then they stay on. And so what you'd like to do is, okay, I'm going to flash a light at the fish, and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to turn my sensor on, and only the neurons that were active as a result of flashing the light do something. We don't know how to do that yet. And then cell voltage. You know, we need one good one. I mean, you know, calcium sensors are way ahead. And so, like I said, if you've got a great idea for, for a voltage sensor, you know, the world's ready to beat a path at your door. Well, how about microscopes? Well, microscopes have been theoretically limited in one level for more than 100 years. Um, they're not very good at seeing through cloudy stuff. They're not very good at seeing through um, you know, like heat on highway stuff, aberrations. They're not very good at live samples. You know, it's really hard to build a microscope and put it on a mouse, although they've done it. There, in fact, is a rat with a microscope attached to its brain at Genalia right now. Um, it's a little clunky, <laughs> but it's a start. So we want to see through cloudy stuff and lumpy stuff. Lumpy stuff is really hard. Your brain is really lumpy. The problem is, is, that, is that with microscopes, you're usually fast or good. You'd like to be fast and good because neurons are fast. They run at 1,000 times per second. And so if you can't take pictures at 1,000 times per second, you're going to miss a lot. And so the picture that I showed you of, of, of Misha and, and Philip's microscope is awesome. It runs at one per second. We can spend a million dollars on parts and make it run at 10 per second. Huge improvement. Not nearly good enough. So lots of stuff left to do. So the conclusion is, is that, that um, Genalia Farm was designed to do exactly this. People like me who build instruments and, and think about how would you measure that, and biologists who know, I think if we can measure this simple system, we can gain some traction and insight. And so an interactive process of developing tools in biology, because it has to be interactive. I don't know what tool to do until somebody walks into my lab with a sample saying, I want to measure this here, while the mouse runs around the room. Um, and so breakthrough tools have been the pathway. So your dean told you about the discovery of the black body background of the Big Bang. That invention was a direct result of the invention of the lowest noise amplifier ever created. It was called a microwave maser. It was invented in the mid-50s. And these two guys, Arnold Penzias and Bob Wilson, both friends of mine, they're, they won their Nobel Prize a month after I got to Bell Labs. It was very exciting for a new employee. Um, and, and the funny thing was is that at Bell Labs, it wasn't that big a deal to win a Nobel Prize. They won a lot of them. And so, um, and so, so for instance, Steve Chu, our just, just resigned energy secretary, and I got to Bell Labs on the same, in the same year. We were, we were contemporaries. I didn't win a Nobel Prize. Steve did. Um, but nonetheless, that, that discovery was a direct result of this microwave amplifier that had zero noise, literally zero noise. So they put it on their antenna, and they pointed their antenna at the sky, and they saw a signal. And they thought, what's that? We should have no signal. So they pointed it at the ground, signal went away. They pointed it at the sky, so they went into the, the this is called a horn antenna. So they went inside, they cleaned out some pigeon poop, literally. And, and um, then they pointed at the sky, they pointed at the ground, over and over and over. The thing I think that was really sad about that Nobel Prize is they published the fact that they had seen a signal that was clearly coming from the sky. They did not know what it was. They wrote a data paper. We see a signal that comes from the sky, we don't know what it is. So they went and gave a talk at Princeton, and a physicist at Princeton said, I read that other paper. <laughs> it's the microwave background of the Big Bang. And so, the, the point is, is that a new tool almost always creates new science. But it's a lot easier if you create new science while, well, new tools while holding on to new science because you get there quicker. Um, and so the, 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 the last thing I'd like to say is, is that neuroscience is the broadest discipline I have ever participated in. There is room for everybody from mathematics to people who like to pet rats and everything in between. Machinists, computer programmers, microscope builders, people who like to do molecular biology, and so anywhere in science is, and neuroscience is a problem that's going to last for hundreds of years, and so it's a great place to think about where to apply scientific tools. So I'm going to stop there and uh, let you guys ask questions if you have any. <coughs> Last week. 
Yeah, the question is, is, is what's this program that the government is going to do? So I, I'm sad to say that, you know, that this was a political event and it's mostly a political program. <laughs> but what, what it is, is that, is that there has been a committee meeting for about the last three years trying to understand how you would organize the tool development problem around brain activity measurement. Janelia Farm spends $30 million a year doing this. There's, a, there's another private research institute in Seattle funded by Paul Allen called the Allen Institute for Brain Research. They spend $40 million a year doing this. So the, the idea is to invent a program that is targeted towards that problem funded by the government. They already fund sort of pieces of it, but, the, but in, in the way that government science gets funded is you add a little money and you try and organize what you do and you hope that increases the, the efficiency and that's what it's about. And so it's divided into three parts. 40, so they announced 100 million and it's a budget request too, so it's not there yet. Um, 40 million will go to the National Institutes of Health to do the biology stuff. 50 million will go to the, de the DARPA, the Defense Applied Research Products Agency. Um, that's, that's, yeah, the Defense Advanced, anyway, DARPA. Um, they spend a lot of money on stuff you don't know much about. <laughs> it's almost all secret. But they're really good at nanotechnology, and so they're going to fund the nanotechnology part of this. Nanotechnology is important because neurons are small, and, and sensors that fit where neurons live is, a, is, a, is an important part. And then $10 million will go to the National, or the National Science Foundation to do the computational problem. Because when I do an experiment in my lab, it is not unusual for me to generate 30, 40 gigabytes of image data in an afternoon. Sometimes 100 gigabytes of data in an afternoon. It takes a lot of computer firepower to turn that into information. That's data. It is not information. Information is, is, is extractable. The computational problem is big and important. No others? Okay. Oh, yes. Well, I can just give you some sort of structural numbers because since we don't understand either one, it's a little difficult to be, to be um, clear. And so a fruit fly brain has about 100,000 neurons and about, 100, uh, and about 100 million connections. A human brain has 100 million neurons and 10 to the 13 connections. And so depending on how you count, maybe 100,000 times more complex. That's a lot. But, you know, you can do cooler stuff than a fruit fly can do, and so it's not surprising. <laughs> yeah? So, once we understand, once we understand how fruit fly works, so will that accelerate our understanding of the human brain if we get the process down? Well, the answer is that's the basis of almost all biology, is, is that biology is self-similar, you know, that, that, that your neurons spike, send signals, almost exactly the same way that mouse neurons work. I mean, there's almost no difference at all. And so, and so fruit fly neurons are more accessible. They're, in fact, a little different, but, but, they, but they, do, they do quite similar stuff. Whereas, for example, a worm's neurons are just really different. And so lots of people don't think it's worthwhile studying worm neurons because they don't look like our neurons. I'm interested in any brain, you know, so I'll take what I can get. But, but the answer to your question is, we expect so, because if we discover a, a, a way that, that a circuit works in a fruit fly, it's likely that circuits will work similarly or even the same way in, in mammals or fish. Again, you know, the, the zebrafish is a, really good, is a really good test case because it's a vertebrate. And vertebrate neuroscience is very similar across all species. And so it's likely that if we can figure out a zebrafish, we're well on our way to understanding what you do with a, with a lot bigger scale. <laughs>